We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions. Tonight, the question comes from Ross, aka More Games. Please, who asked, What board game do you most enjoy playing with your parents or family? Looking for holiday recommendations. So originally, I had planned to break this question into two specific topics uh, that are related and start off tonight by talking about gaming with family and offering some advice for doing so. And then following up next week with a list of games that are great for playing with family during the holidays, which would include the game Sean and I love playing with our particular family. But with us no longer having another episode before Christmas, I figure we may as well combine both of these into one longer topic tonight. And due to that, we are only going to have one review later in the show. So settle in, maybe a nice warm cup of cocoa, and get ready for holiday game talk. So what I do want to start with is those tips and tricks. I, I want to spend a bit of time sharing some things we've learned over the years for making a family game night successful, to, to, to make things go over well with your family. Now, this advice is tailored to family game night, as that's what Ross's question asked. But pretty much all of this applies to any holiday gathering with friends, family, co-workers, or really any event that's going to have a mix of hobby gamers, casual gamers, and non-gamers. Right. Um, like, as soon as I read playing game with parents or families, um, I felt it was implied, and I hope I'm not wrong here, um, that meant parents or family who aren't gamers or at least parents and family who aren't familiar with most of the hobby games that we talk about on our show, and which I assume most of our listeners are more familiar with. This means not only may they not used to be, uh, be used to the complexity of hobby games, but they may simply be not interested in taking the time for them amidst all the holiday hustle and bustle. So we're going to start with some generic tips. So this is just if you're getting together with your family for the holidays, and you're heading over for the big Christmas party, the New Year's party, the the uh, uh, do you have Hanukkah parties? I apologize. I, I was raised with North American um, Christian Catholic Christmas and everything went with it um, with some Orthodox um, Ukrainian thrown in there. Things like some of my, my friends and relatives didn't get their gifts to little Christmas. Um, so I do apologize for my lack of knowledge of other holiday traditions. But whatever that gathering happens to be. These are some tips and tricks to try to get some gaming involved. Now, one of the big things here is bring games. Incur you yep. want to play games, but don't expect to play games. Not everyone may match your idea of what you're going to be doing on those holiday uh, at that holiday event. Yeah, the whole thing here is it, like me. If, if you can ask ahead of time, right? The best way to do it is, hey, do you mind if I bring some games? That may or may not, because some people are, might immediately think, oh, yeah, one of his, you know, they were over, you know, uh, during the spring and you brought out Twilight Imperium and everyone's eyes glossed over and like, oh, we don't want that, right? Like, no, no, I'm going to bring some light, light party games. I, I'm just going to bring some games that'll be fun. Or what I would do is I would just pack them in the trunk and not walk in the door with a huge pile of games. And that's actually another tip is don't show up with a ton of games. Just show up with a small selection. And like I said, leave them in the trunk, leave them in the car, pack them somewhere. And then, you know, if there's a time during the night where, you know, everyone's done eating and things seem to be slowing down, you're like, hey, does everyone want to play a game? I happen to have some out in the car. I'll go grab them. Now, if you are your family already has some gaming traditions, that's a different story. Heck, they may already be ready for you when you walk in the door. But Very true. But again, with family, there's a lot of other people, you know, families expand all the time. So while it may be a, a family tradition that you all sit around and play Twilight Imperium every Christmas, if there are new members of the family, whether they've been married in, born in, grown up, whatever it may be, don't force anyone to join in your traditions. Suggest yes. it, encourage them to play, but don't be pushy about it. Yeah, you don't want to force anyone to play who doesn't want to play. This is the same tip we always give. Parents are like, how do I raise my kids to be gamers? And I'm like, don't force it on them. The, the biggest way to turn people away from this hobby is to force them to do something that they don't expect to enjoy or aren't going to enjoy. You want enthusiastic consent. You want people who want to sit down and play games. And to that end, you're going to need to sell them on the games before they sit down. But if someone's like, no, I just don't feel like playing games, don't. Yeah, you can do maybe one. Ah, come on, just play. 
but don't keep pushing. Don't be that person that's trying to trying to make everyone else have fun. It rarely works out. Yeah, and there may be some people in the group who are just those negative Nancys or our Nellies who who just always say no to everything and need a little bit of pushing. But if you know that, if you know if the family understands that dynamic, that's one thing. But generally, if someone isn't interested, let them not be interested because yeah. that's okay too. Now, another thing is you don't have to get everyone to play. This is important. If you've got 12 people at your event, you don't necessarily have to have a 12 player game. Now, this will be a good way to weed out those people who don't want to play. Right. When you do say, hey, everyone want to play a game and three people are like, no, nah, not really. Well, maybe the rest of you can still play a game. But you don't have to cater to everyone at once. You don't have to bring these massive high player count games. And there are some great ones out there, but they're not always the best game. Like type of games you're looking for here, probably, which I'm kind of jumping ahead a bit, is you want social games where people get to hang out. You get too many people involved and that may actually fall apart. So not everyone has to play the games and more so not everyone has to play the same game. If you bring multiple games, you can break into groups. Everyone can sit there and do their own little thing in their own table. It depends on your physical space, of course, and lots of other little considerations. But don't force people to play. Not everyone has to play. And if you do have a ton of people playing, you don't have to play the same game. Yeah. One of the things that happens a lot during these holidays, especially uh, almost regardless of your tradition, is cooking and eating. And now the mm -hmm. people who are cooking, if you're, you know, if you're going to a Christmas dinner and, you know, you've got three people who are in and out of the kitchen constantly think they may want to play the game, but you also need to make sure that they're involved in a game that has the ability to sort of pause and break up like that. Mm -hmm. Whereas there might be some other people who want to sit down and, you know, just stay out of the way until dinner's done because they've learned that walking into the kitchen at the wrong time is a bad thing or whatever yeah. the, uh, the issue may be. So having a couple of options there can be a great thing that way too. The uh, other thing too is uh, I kind of mentioned, but don't bring too much because you don't want to give to people too many choices. And honestly, to be fair, you don't want to give people many choices at all. Because if you have a group of people, I think everyone's gone through this. The more people you have, the more difficulty you're going to have settling on a choice. You are much better off maybe bringing three games, but only presenting one or two at a time going, hey, everyone, we just had dinner. We're all laughing. We're, we're, the drinks are starting to flow. Let's get together and play a game of just one. It's this really quick to play. I can explain it in 10 seconds. You just need a dry erase marker. And you know what? We won't even use those. We'll leave them in the box. Just need paper and pencils. And I'll teach you how to play. And that's it. You just present it that way. And then if enough people say no, maybe you present something else or you do the other go, hey, I've got this copy of Point Salad and I've got this other card game. Uh, I've, I've got the great Del Moody. This one, you're sitting there and you're building an engine doing this. This one's more of a gamer's game. And then this one, you've got a special deck of cards and you're trying to do this. And it's more silly. Would you prefer this or this? And then don't leave it open for or something else. Just do you, would you prefer this or this? Try to limit the the number of suggestions, the number of options, sorry, the number of options when presenting games at an event like that. It's just like asking if someone wants, where does someone wants to go out for dinner? If you yeah. say, do you want to eat pizza or Chinese? You might get a decision. If you just say, where would you like to eat? You could mm -hmm. still be there for hours later. Now, speaking of eating, Gaming and eating are two separate things. Mm -hmm. We've talked about this on the show many, many times, but especially around the holidays, there's always lots of finger foods and treats and chocolates, chocolates that melt on your fingers and can get all over cards, never to be extricated again. Uh, you want to mark your playing cards? Start eating some chocolates and then playing with them. That'll <laughs> mark your cards for good. Yeah, dips. Dips are also bad. <laughs> People, no matter how careful you are, dri dips drip. Um, so so the big thing here is we're not saying don't eat and game. We're just saying don't do them together. Now, in general, I say everyone eat first and then you go play a game and then maybe take a break and have a snack and really separate it. That's what I prefer to do. We or you're gaming, you take a break to eat and then you go back to gaming. But I get that people like snacks at the game table. The thing is, is try to separate them in the fact that the snacks are somewhere else. So like if you have your kitchen table with your game set up on it and then you have the snacks maybe in the kitchen or on an island. So you have to go away from the game table, go over, have a couple snacks and then come back. There's better chance people are going to do things like wipe their fingers and clean them and so on. Um, the other thing you can do is on the game side is make sure to protect your games because no matter how, how much you separate it, 
someone's probably going to come in with something, a Timbit that they picked up on the way in, or they're going to have their coffee in their hand and something's going to spill. So also be sure to protect your games. But you really, you don't want the bowl of dip in the center of the table sitting next to the Catan board. Now, another thing that goes with eating is drinking. I don't want to get into the details of the merits and detriments of drinking, but be aware that once people are consuming alcohol during a game night, have some plan for that. Uh, make sure people have rides home and all the usual stuff, but also plan the games you are going to play accordingly and be even more prepared for things like spills, bumps, and things getting lost. And uh, as I mentioned in our chat room, a roll of paper towels sitting on the table does definitely make some strong suggestions as to keeping clean yes. and cleaning up. Pro tip. This is one that I didn't even think of that I had someone point out after a few of our New Year's events. Let everyone know where the garbage is and provide extra garbage bags around the room. So that was something I didn't even realize we were doing. We have one spot to put garbage in our game room, and it's a little kind of pull out drawer that's not easy to access except from one part of the room. And someone's like, for one, I've been coming to your house for years. I didn't know where the garbage was. So I was just kind of made a little pile and stuff, stuff it in like, you know, on the corner of the table. And I've had other friends that are like, man, just so now we put out some extra bags on the end of TV trays, right? That way people have a place to put their garbage or else it will build up on the table. All right. You have anything else for generic kind of tips to, to get things going? Uh, I think the real big thing is understand the vibe. Uh, if there are people cooking, you know, if the kitchen is off limits, you know, if, if great grandmama runs the kitchen, like a, uh, you know, like a, a army barracks and everyone knows that, you know, if you go in there, you're going to either be drafted into cooking <laughs> or kicked out, just, you know, don't try and set up a game at the, the kitchen table, even if there's space, yes. uh, you know, make use of the available space. Don't uh, open up or use space that is uh, already pre-assigned to other duties. Fair enough. And actually that kind of fits in with what I want to talk about next, which is what kinds of games should you bring to an event like this? And one of the things you're going to need to know ahead of time, and maybe you don't, maybe you are going to Aunt Judy's house for the first time, or you have a rotating Christmas Eve party that's at a different relatives every year or you've been invited to a stranger's house that you've never been to before, um, or your new significant other, you're going to meet their family for the first time. You don't know the space, but it's going to be a little more difficult. But if you can plan the games and what you're bringing and what you ex and your expectations on the space you're going to. Now, one of the things to be aware of, though, is don't count on having space to play games. This is the reason games like charades are so popular. They don't need a table. And they don't need everyone sitting at the table. Games like um, the one I mentioned, Monstrosity's one, um, Just One's another one. Games that don't require a table are probably a good idea. Like have them as a backup plan because you can't count on having that beautiful kitchen table you saw when you were over for drinks two weeks ago because it's, it might be covered in food or it might be covered in presents or it might just be decorated for the holidays or it might have a Christmas village on it. Even games like Psychobab, which are great group games, take up just enough to space that you can't set it up on a, on a, uh, you know, on a, on a little folding TV tray, uh, that, cause that may be all the space you're able to get, you know, I, you know, a, a center place to throw your cards. If you're playing a trick taker, you can probably mm -hmm. manage to find something like that, but, uh, don't expect necessarily all that much more. Now you could always, if you got like a minivan like me, throw a card table in the back. That might be a bonus. That could be an extra thing you could bring along. I know my parents used to do that back in the day. My dad had a card table in the back of uh, his old Lincoln. And sometimes we go to parties and he'd be like, you want to play cards? Because that's my parents were all about playing cards, traditional playing card games. And be like, oh, no table, no problem. And he'd go get his table out of the back. So it just kind of goes, these tips have been going on for generations here. Uh, other things to be aware of is lighting. Most hobby board games need pretty good light. Most party games, thankfully, aren't as uh, light specific. But as we've learned, even light card games like, say, The Deadlies, which is kind of like Uno for gamers. Like if your family likes Uno, bring The Deadlies. There's there's one of our game recommendations tonight. Can be harder to play depending on the lighting you are in. Um, generally, Christmas dinners well lit. But then once the dinner's done, people like to turn the lights down. Seating is important. Try to see if you can find games that can be playing standing versus seated, or more importantly, some people seated, some people standing. 
Co-op games are generally good for this, where people can work together and collaborate. That also works well for when people can leave the room and come back in. So any type of like detective game or something like that, or a, a cooperative, even Shadows uh, over Camelot, where like you can jump in and take a turn and then leave and other people can do things and you don't have to come back to another. And that's also when, while well, it's your turn, you can sit down and take your turn and then give up the seat for someone else. Another uh, nice tip is pay attention to how much uh, visual acuity is required. This goes, I was thinking about with the lighting. Uh, mm -hmm. If you've got games with really little text on those cards that you have to, you have to read that not only requires good lights, but good eyesight to see what's on these cards. It may yeah. seem like it's a, it's a pretty simple trick taker or something, but then there's that little extra bit of, of text that you need to read on those cards. And that may put some people off depending on, on visual acuity of those at the, the table. Uh, you, you don't, you don't necessarily have to be uh, a, a blind people like uh, Ryan to really struggle yeah. with, uh, you know, playing some trick takers and other card games that, would otherwise just be a nice, simple, friendly card game. No, I totally legit. I am sure at some point, if my kids started having friends over for, for family game night, I have a feeling I might be the, the, the old dad who can't see the cards anymore. Now, another one to watch is uh, time limits. Um, for one, you don't want to do games. Uh, uh, props to Red Meeple Ryan for this one. You don't want to do games with lengthy setup and teardown, especially if you're gaming prior to a meal. Uh, a lot of non-gamers are not going to account for how long it takes to clean up a game. They are expecting you to take the Monopoly box and sweep everything in. If you've got your custom box insert where everything goes into the right spot, when they're like, oh, turkey's ready and your game's still out on the table, that can be a problem. Um, also be aware of how much time you have. Like, how long is the event running? Uh, are you eating? What is the plans after dinner? Um, how long are people expecting to stay afterwards? How long is the host willing to have people at their place and all of that? So be aware of time limits. And this is where if you don't know better, the shorter, the better, the, the short, quick, rapid fire games, games like we mentioned already, but Psycho Babble, where one round is extremely quick. Yeah, the full game could take a while. Monstrosity is another one. The full game takes a while, but you don't have to play the full game. Concept is another one where you can basically you finish around, you can pack it up at any time. That's the best thing to do if you don't know your time limits. But then if you do know, it's like, hey, we're getting together. We're watching the game and then we're going to eat. And then people are willing to stay overnight if they want. You can crash on the couch. Maybe this is the perfect event to bring out your Twilight Imperium. As long as everyone's agreed to it ahead of time. Don't surprise people with Twilight Imperium. And especially be aware if you have a large family. I know I've been involved in family gatherings where there are rental locations being used. Mm -hmm. Uh, your, your, your family is, you know, goes down to the curling club and has their Christmas, your, your, yep. their giant Christmas party there. Uh, when that, when you are out of time, when your rental is up, you need to vacate the premises, not start cleaning up. Yeah. Uh, so be aware of things like that. If you are using external locations and not someone's house. Now, the other one, of course, uh, watch the player count. Personally, in those big events like that, I think what you're going to want to bring is like two player, four player games, and you're never going to get everyone playing, but you might get the people at your table playing, right? So the big family gathering events where they do rent out a hall. I've been to a couple of these. Um, heck, we've done it at a wedding where you just grab the people at your table and get them to play a game. So you have two player games. Like if it's me and my wife going to the event, that way Dan and I can play something while everyone else is dancing or whatever I have going on. Or you bring other ones. Now, um, now if you know your event's 18 people, Again, I don't I don't recommend trying to find an 18 player game. Maybe it'll work. You take code names, break into two uh, groups of nine. Or you do uh, something where everyone can take part, which is a little difficult. Um, code names is an, or not code names. Uh, concepts, an example of that. But in that case, you want to buy the big mat. There's like a giant mat you can get for code for for concepts so people can see it. But be aware of the player counts. And again, don't be afraid to break people up. Like If everyone knows there's going to be gaming after dinner. That's the best group to break people up because they know there's going to be gaming and they're probably expecting some everyone's got to play together. And we're probably going to play something like werewolf because it's the only playing that plays 18 people. Surprise them with three six player games. And I bet you everyone will have a better time than they would have had, um, except for the person who wins werewolf and like the two that are left at the end. Everyone else probably had a better time playing the other six player games. Also. Be aware that sometimes it's okay to have a two player game. Maybe it's just yeah. you and your cousin who you only ever see on Christmas who happens to also be a gamer. 
And you guys yep. have the ability without angering the rest of your family to go off into a corner and play a couple of really great mm -hmm. games. Go for it. Maybe you guys can communicate in advance and figure out a weightier game, play a little medium weight game that doesn't take up too much space or time. Uh, and that could be okay. Maybe the rest of the family is going to go off and, and play whatever it is they like to play or just sit and talk and not play any games at all, which is also okay. And to be fair, when I was growing up, that game was Talisman and the other player was my cousin, John. Every family Christmas party, the Sawyer family Christmas on my mom's side of the family, John and I would find a table somewhere or the floor, um, often in like a bedroom floor or on a bed. We've done that too. And we would play our yearly game of Talisman. Um, the interesting one about that is my two cousins, Matt and Jason, eventually, who who when we were first playing it, they were too old and too cool for for toy looking board games. But then as they got older, started joining us and like playing talisman on, at, at my family Christmas party was a thing for a while there. And then the other the adults, I don't even know what they're doing. They're probably playing traditional card games with my parents or they were watching the game because there's usually some game on of some form of sports or another at every family event I've been to, or they're watching Christmas movies. So that was another tradition, watching Christmas movies. Now, another thing to watch out for is components. Now, we talked about hard to set up, tough to, you know, long to set up and things like that. But even if it's easy to set up, if there are a ton of little pieces, do you really want to have to go through Aunt Mildred's shag carpeting to try and <laughs> find those pieces when they hit the floor? Yeah, with a large group of people, too, and people who are not familiar with hobby games, they may not realize where to put things, how to hold things, how to stack them, um, and, and things get knocked. And I hate to say it, but the average person doesn't think of games having much value um, and think nothing of some cards falling on the floor and just like scooping them up with a the broom and dustpan. And and people don't realize how expensive um, hobby board games can be and things like cards get bent. Um, again, I say if you can protect your cards, right? Sleeve your cards, um, do some things to protect them. But just parties are not a great place for anything with lots of small pieces. Um, I learned this as a small child, opening up Lego kits before getting home or model kits. Uh, the same goes for your games. Yeah, absolutely. It's one of those things where people really do think about the whole sweeping into the box like like Monopoly. Uh, there yep. may be a couple of games, older families who have played the, the game of life. There was actually a little bit of box organization in those original games of life with, with glass jars for things. But for the most part, games just shoved back in the box. And that's yep. what people are used to. And, and that same level of treatment of the pieces, not even just putting it away, but the treatment of it was a matter of, you know, sweep it away. It's, yeah. it's just a throwaway, you know, $10 it's, card, it's, $10 it's box of games. $10 board game. Now, the other thing to watch for is the game weight. This you're going to base on who you're playing, right? If, if your family is a bunch of gamers, great. Go with whatever types of games you enjoy. But if you've got uncles, cousins, young kids, whatever, you want to stick to games that are easy to teach, quick to understand. You need to catch people's attention and get them playing like in under five minutes and, and probably less than that. Like, like five's long. Five minutes to explain a game to someone sitting at uncle Jerry's and they don't kind of don't really want to be there and they're stuffed. They're full. They've eaten a lot of food. Five minutes is a very long time. You want quick to explain quick to get engaged. Now you don't necessarily have to teach the whole game, right? We've done episodes on how to teach games and everything like that. The best thing is something you can jump into right of the way. This is where the cooperative games work, right? You don't have to explain pandemic to people. You could just set up the board, have it going and then it's your go. Here are your cards. Here's what we have to do. I suggest you go here. Like you kind of jump right into them. That's when those games work out, the, the heavier games. Again, Shadows Over Camelot's a great hidden trader game. And you can jump in. You just get people play for your cards and then it, walk them through it. Have someone moderate so you can look at their hands and be like, look, you can go over here. You can go over here. You want to try to do this. You want to try to stop that. Um, I know there's other games. These are just the ones that keep popping into my head for whatever reason. But get those games, watch the heavy weight, try to stick with lower weight and easy, quick to explain. I said less than five minutes, like as, as short as possible. The deadlies, I have everyone hand out their cards. I tell everyone what the different suits do and I just say go. And I'll do the, try not to do the, well, don't, don't worry, it's not as complicated as it seems. That's just going to scare people away. One of the things I would say is, first off, know your games, but 
you should always know your games if you're going to be teaching other people anyway. But if you have to take out a rule book, whether it's for learning the setup or counting the pieces or whatever, you're probably going to lose people right there. Yeah. If the rule book comes out, especially if it's even if you don't need even if you don't need it except to, to to check a couple of things, if you pull out a big thick rule book, you're going to turn people off. People are going to go, uh, you know what? Maybe not. Yeah. Uh, so if you can leave the rule book in the box, you're a mile ahead of where you would be otherwise. Yeah, totally agree. So what are some other things to watch for, for what types of games you're going to bring? Again, don't bring too many. Cater it to the group. Uh, another thing, too, is like if you know your family's into a licensed game, that is a great way to get people invested is to bring a game based on that license. You know, if everyone um, got together and watched the Doctor Who Christmas special and then bring some kind of, you know, bring Time of the Daleks or bring, if, if you want lighter, bring Doctor Who Yahtzee. It's still Yahtzee, but at least it has that theme that's going to get people engaged. Although if you now, have the Doctor Who Yahtzee TARDIS, please put some felt on the inside. That game is so uh, incredibly loud. <laughs> yeah, there's something else. There's there's something else to be aware of is um you don't want to bother other people. So, you know, well, Happy Salmon might seem like the perfect game to get everyone um, having a good time and playing together. And it's something you can play standing up, which is great. Depending on what else is going on, if if there's a group of people just trying to have a nice conversation and catch up because they haven't seen each other in 12 months, they don't want to be having their conversation next to a table playing Happy Salmon. Now, one other little awkward one, but I think it's worth touching on in this day and age. There are a lot of people getting together at holidays, and they don't necessarily always agree with each other. So mm -hmm. try to avoid games that lean in certain directions. Mo was mentioning Pandemic earlier. Well, if you've got yeah. anti-vaxxer aunts and uncles, that may not be the right choice. Uh, you know, there are certain games that encourage discussions about certain topics, which you may not want to bring to your family events because of people you know will be there. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it may be a great game and you may not agree or care what whoever your fa that family member is, but it's the holidays. There's no reason to go around starting fights if you don't need to. Another one to watch too is age recommended ages for games. Family gatherings tend to have multiple generations of people gathering together. That's part of what's so awesome about them. So when you are picking out what games to bring, either bring games for different age groups, like have animal upon animal with you because that'll play everyone actually. So that's, that's actually a good example of just a game you can bring for any age limit, but maybe bring a copy of Vivo Topo or some other kids game Monza, if you happen to have it or something really light for the kids to play and then heavier games for the grownups to play or better yet games that where you can all play together. Dexterity games are great for this. Dexterity games tend to work for any age limit. Not everyone loves dexterity games. It, it might be a hard sell. And again, if someone says, no, nah, that's not for me, have them not play. Don't, don't be surprised that, that person says, hey, it's not for me, then watches you guys playing and have a great time and ask to join in later. Definitely had that happen. Um, Dexterity games are great for that. Animal Upon Animal, there's even a Christmas-themed one, so you can even keep it thematic. Um, toss that in there. Go Cuckoo, um, there's, another great one. You know, yep. Go Cuckoo is one of those things where everyone will look at it and say, oh, we're going to play Pickup Sticks? And you say, no, not quite. This is a twist. Because everyone knows Pickup Sticks. And this is yeah. just, a, a, and that's a great way to actually introduce people to this fun game that mm -hmm. takes up a little bit of space, but isn't too bad. You can set that on a, on a uh, card table or a coffee, little, uh, little folding uh, TV tray and uh, go to town. All right. Uh, and then one tip from the chat from Eggman Jr., which I agree is okay. Feel free. Bring more games. Just don't present too many at once. Maybe keep them in the trunk. Right. And then you can go get them. Uh, this is a good one for the heavier weight games. Like maybe you show up and you're like, oh, do you guys want to play a game? And they're like, oh, yeah, sure. I'll play a game. And I'm like, well, I've got um, Yahtzee Doctor Who and I've got Outsmarted, which is a, a trivia game where we can play together as teams. But you all have to download an app. But don't worry about it. And, and, and they're like, oh, you, you don't have anything like, you know, tapestry. And you're like, oh, OK, <laughs> then. <laughs> Well, actually, I have my copy of Ark Nova in the trunk, and if you'd like to play it, I can go grab that. So, yeah, always add that this is the thing I'm guilty of. I bring way too many games everywhere, 
but I tend to do that to events where people expect me to bring too many games. But like when I went up to my uncle's then uh, during the this isn't a holiday, but when I went up to visit my uncle and aunt at their um, their farmhouse, I brought a bag full of games. There was probably six, seven games in there and we ended up playing two. But when I went, hey, do you guys want to play a game? I didn't go, hey, do you want to play distilled or do you want to play this? or Do you want to play this? I was like, hey, I've got this card game. You guys like card games a lot. I think you'll enjoy this one. And the Deadlies was a fantastic hit at that particular event. And so was Telestrations. Absolutely. All right. So we will be checking in with our chat room once we get through some of our particular family game night favorites. Um, so if you do have any more tips, please keep them coming. But what we are going to do now is get back to Ross's actual question. And Ross had asked, what games do you, us, since we're the ones answering the question, what games do you play with parents and family looking for holiday tips? So we're going to list off some games that we personally love playing with our families, which is going to be quite different from our usual game recommendation lists, I, I, I've got to say. So I think what we're going to do is start off with our top five, and then I'll be sharing a bunch more. I've, I've obviously done more gaming with my family than Sean has um, just over the years. So we're going to start off with the top five, and then maybe we'll share some other ones that have worked well for us. So for me, it's playing with my kids who are in fact gamers. So my list may not be great for the average family gathering because I'm going to start with DC deck building game. Uh, and this one is fantastic. I love it because there are so many different games all contained in one box. And it's mm -hmm. just a matter of deciding whether you want to play cooperative or competitive and whether you want to be villains or, or heroes, really. You know, you got a couple of quick choices, but it's all right there in one box. Easy to set up, uh, especially with the uh, the neoprene mat we've got now. So you don't even have to worry about remembering set up at all. You just roll out the mat and slap the cards down in the right spot. So now I know I've asked you this before when you've recommended this game, but it might have changed over the last little while. If someone was new to this game, where's the best place to start now? Uh, if you're starting with, uh, you know, more than two players, uh, I still think it's Teen Titans. I think Teen Titans is, is, uh, is definitely the one to go to. Okay. Um, yeah. Now, my immediate family are all gamers, right? And I talk about gaming with them all the time. So I am not going to share the games I like playing with Deanna and my two daughters, because that's what we talk about every week here on the show, pretty much. Um, they're as involved in the hobby as we are. But when I'm looking at my extended family, there's a mix there. Like Deanna's mom is a gamer. She plays a lot of hobby games. She's still kind of blown away by hobby games and how different they are. But again, when I go up north to my Uncle Claude and Nancy's, they are they are card players that I wouldn't call them gamers. They play cards. They play lots of different card games. And that's about it. Then we extend things to the even more extended family when I get my other co my cousins, my aunts and uncles. And yeah, they know what games are. Like I said, my my two cousins used to play Talisman with us, but like they don't know anything about family or hobby board gaming. When we get a bunch of us together, I break the rules a bit here and I like to break out a game called The Great Dal Moody, which actually has a lot in common with a game um, that we talked about a lot late with 12 Days of Christmas. Because The Great Dal Moody is a special deck of cards where there's one, one, two, twos, three, threes, all the way up to 13, 13s. And you play a game. It's a it's a hand shedding game where you're trying to get rid of your cards. Now, the box says something like eight players, but I think I played it with like 18 um, what happens in that game is the, the more players you have, the more merchants you have. And I've actually had, uh, my cousin, John has a copy. We've combined two copies and then just warned everyone. There's two ones and, you know, 12 sixes. This is just, everyone gets this game. It's really simple. You, someone leads a number of cards. The next player has to play the same number of cards, but a lower number. And you do that until someone's out and then the peon collects the cards. And then the first one out becomes the Great Dal Moody. The last one out becomes the Peon. And then we always play with silly rules. I provide hats. When I bring this out to a family game night, I provide a big ass cowboy hat for the Great Dal Moody. Um, and then I also have like a gold necklace for them. And we've done various other things for the Peon over the years. For years, it was this plastic werewolf mask. But eventually that werewolf mask broke. But that's what the Peon had to wear. And the Peon doesn't get a chair. And the Great Dal Moody gets to choose where they sit. It, it mixes a rather solid, tactical, somewhat strategic card game that most card game players are going to understand the concepts of, which is pure silliness. 
So for me, again, more deck building, but it's a fun kind of competitive deck building, which is clank. Uh, and I find it's, it's the, the level of competition and, but fun, you know, everyone's working on their own and yes, whoever gets out first may or may not win. Uh, but it's far from a guaranteed thing. You can really push your luck and stay down there a little bit longer and come out with the bigger treasures. Uh, even if you aren't last, as long as you get above ground and, and, you know, it's just that great fun game and everyone's eager and worried about, you know, making too much noise and, and it's just a fun game for, uh, is, that, is it max four on that one? I forgot to check. I think it's max. Yeah, I think it yeah. is. Yep. What I like about that one is even when you're out, you want to know how the other players are doing. Like it keeps you engaged. You're like, oh, are they going to make it? Are they going to make it? Are they going to get out? Are they going to get out? And that's what makes that game work. So even if you're the first one out, you care a lot about what's still happening in that game. Now, one of the most recent games I personally played with my family, and I already called it out earlier, is with my aunt and uncle um, and and their extended family because my my aunt's sister was over and and their son and daughter were over and all this, we got everyone together and we were playing Telestrations. Telestrations is one of the the biggest hits that I've had with family events for years. I, I've yet to have it fail. You often do get the player who's like, oh, I don't know how to draw. And you're like, ah, it doesn't matter. And maybe they say no. But this is one I've definitely, we started with an eight player game because some of the family said no. And by the end of the night, we were playing a 12 player game because the people had said no, were like, oh yeah, I want to get in on this. Um, it's a fantastic game. Um, the 12 player party packs perfect for this, but honestly there there's, you could make it longer. <laughs> like if you had multiple sets, you could fit more players. Um, you just got to make sure you have enough pages in the books or you just play it. So the book doesn't go all the way around, which is another way you can play it with extra players is yeah, maybe your book only makes it two thirds of the way around the table before you have to reveal, but who cares? The whole fun of Telestrations is the 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 eat poop you cat, the the telephone game part where the clue you started with is 99% of the time not what you end up with and laughing at things like four legged ducks. Absolutely. Now, sometimes not all family gatherings are big events. Uh, if it's just my son and I, the Duke is a fantastic mm -hmm. way to get a little competition on. And it's easily played on any old table you can get your hands on. It just doesn't need a lot of space. It's just a bag and a small board uh, and you're good to go. And uh, while it is competitive, as long as you know that, you know, the people you're playing with are, are good for competitive and uh, and not table flippers, it's all fun. This is a good one to bring for uh, that relative that's really into chess. If you, you want to like, hey, I, I know you like chess. You want to try a chess variant? I've had the Duke go over well for that. Now, the other big hit is one I just discovered this year, thanks to Smirk and Dagger um, for forcing us to take home a copy of the Deadlies at Origins. I've called this one out when we were talking about what our, our tips, but this is Uno for gamers. I, I, that's honestly a really good way to describe it. It is a hand shedding game, but it has no player elimination. It has no scoring. There's no adding up your cards at the end of the round. And there's no real pile on the plus fours, whether you're playing the rules or not. There is some take that to it. And yes, it has a theme that might be a little, little, um, depending on how religious some of your relatives are, or how young the kids are. The theme is the seven deadly sins. So that could be an issue. So that's a know your audience thing, but it's not salacious. It's not, it, it's silly. It's, it's cute animals that represent the different sins. I, I, the Deadlies really is good. I, I can't say enough good things about it. Just check out our review to learn more. Absolutely. And well, for me, well, it's a classic, but it's a classic for a reason. And that's Skip Bow. That's one we love at our house. The whole family and frankly, anyone dropping by can quickly pick it up as it plays up to six. So if your family of four is all playing and you've got uh, people dropping in over the, it's really easy to deal someone in and have them up and playing instantly. Uh, I don't even know if I have rules for the game anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's just one of those card games that the people just know or don't. And uh, if you know it, you can teach it and get someone playing uh, as quickly as anything else. Uh, my next one that I've had great success with my family is Bean uh, Bonanza, the original Uwe Rosenberg game before he got into heavy Euros and Polyominoes. Uh, the bean planting card game. 
this is the game I break out for my traditional card gaming family friends and friends where I'm like, all right, you, you, you play normal card games. You'll get this. Now, I will admit it can be a step above what some people are comfortable with it. It does divert from traditional card games in a number of ways. Um, one of the big ones is you can't sort your hand. So the biggest thing that traditional card game players have to learn is don't sort your hand. But there's it's this is actually a trading and negotiation game. And the big thing I like about Bonanza is it gets people talking. This gets people interacting. This is a game I like to start off a family game night with because you've got that whole you haven't seen each other in six, 12 months and everyone's kind of quiet and then trying to do the instead of trying to do the small talk and like, oh, how's school going? Play a game of Bonanza. And by the end of that, everyone will be talking to each other. And now what's become a family tradition with my sister and her in-laws uh, by way of me is Spellmaker. But this is a classic 1978 game that you are not going to find on the major store shelves. Used market, you might be able to find one or two here and there. But uh, this this one, uh, you know, if you if your family has a copy on their shelves, try and break it out for some people on uh, on Christmas sometime. And but do check Board Game Geek. There is a original. Uh, the designer has an, uh, a different plan that it was actually <laughs> released with uh, that I learned about. And uh, making that change to the deck can make a huge difference in how long and painful the game could be. <laughs> Oh, so many long and painful traditional or older games. I don't know what people used to do that they had the entire afternoon to play some of these classics. All right, one for mine. Um, though I got to admit, the last couple of years, we we haven't done this, but a Christmas Eve tradition that started up with um, Deanna's family that we tend to go over on Christmas Eve is to play my copy of Ticket to Ride 10th Anniversary Edition. Now, anyone who's a longtime fan of the show knows I don't love Ticket to Ride. It is not one of my top games in any way, shape, or form, but it's an enjoyable game. And one of the reasons that we started playing it at this was it was easy enough that my kids could play it at a younger age. And it was comfortable for, at the time, my mother-in-law, who was just getting into hobby gaming when we first broke this out the first time. And it just, it's, it's, everyone knows how to play. We all just sit down. Yeah, there's always a couple questions at the beginning, but once people see the root cards, their memory comes back. And I got to say, the 10th anniversary edition is just beautiful, like with the little plastic trains that are all unique per character and the metal tins to put them in. It just it becomes something special. And I don't love Ticket to Ride, but I love playing it on Christmas Eve with that family. And it plays five players, which is another nice one. We have five of us that generally play games together. So, yeah, despite the fact that I probably won't toss it on any other game recommendation list, this is one that we I will happily play every Christmas Eve. Well, there we have it. So those are our top five. Um, now, others, I'm just going to throw out some a bunch of these we've already mentioned, basically, as we we're going through things. I kind of wanted to just scatter this episode with suggestions instead of just giving you a list of 27 of the best games for playing with family. Because every family is different, so it's going to be different what works for you and what works for us. Um, Codenames is one, though the teach on that can be rough for people who haven't played it before. Your best bet with Codenames is to have two players who have played before be the team leaders. Um, especially if, if you have four people who played before, that way you can have the two team leaders and someone on each team that knows what's going on. It tends to work best if you can show it, because I had this completely flop when I tried to describe it to my family once. Uh, concept we mentioned, point salad we mentioned, Racco. Racco is a classic. Uh, my family loves Racco. Racco is one of the few games I can still get my mom to play. My mom will happily sit down and play Racco with us. Um, there's even like big box editions you can get for more players. One of the huge ones for my gaming family that I find works well, that is pretty accessible to most people is Space Base, especially with the big box, because then you can play, what is it, seven players, I think, with yeah. the big box. Might even be nine. So that's a good one for big groups. Um, and I haven't tried it with my family yet because I just got it. Um, but I have a feeling Monstrosity would be as big a hit as Telestrations. Well, maybe not as much. It's close. Close to as big a hit as Telestrations. Oh, really? All of these aside, the biggest thing I find I can bring to a family game night that will probably get played is a deck of cards. 
my family grew up playing euchre hearts spades all of those games and that's what they like playing i know a number of high player count games like pass pass the ace um another one whose name i can't say because we're not explicit uh 31 for playing big player count games i've been to family parties where they had a euchre tournament um with my family that also involved having money <laughs> where you had to buy in before playing each round and if you didn't want to sit out around you just didn't get the points you know so i on it even though yes i'm a hobby gamer i love hobby games um a tradition a deck of cards can often come to the rescue even if i bring traditional like a bunch of hobby games having a pack of cards on hand for where you're like oh do you want to play this game it's about this one yeah Oh, we're going to do this right now. All right. How about we just play some Euchre? Yeah, sure. Let's go. So along with that kind of traditional game, there's other things out there. And now maybe you want to keep Monopoly, even for those who love it, till at least Boxing Day. Though <laughs> I'm willing to bet that there are some families out there who have that game as a Christmas Day tradition, too. I'm sure. What games is are, is are, do you love to play with your family? over the holidays also if you've got any tips for playing with a mix of gamers and non-gamers we'd love to hear about them uh either in the comments to this uh video or our, can you leave comments on a podcast episode maybe on the right podcast player uh you know what you can dm us you can contact us on social media it can be found everywhere as tabletop bellhop one word or better yet join our discord discord.tabletopbellhop.com well, I hope that helps some of you get some gaming in this holiday season. That's it for our tips and top games for a successful holiday game night with family. Now it's time to check in with the lobby, our chat room here on Twitch. Hey, lobbyists. All right. So recommendations that we didn't already call out in the episode is Project L. Project L is a great game to play with family. I've seen a lot of praise for that game. I have not played it myself. But the name makes me remember number nine. Number nine would be a good one. Number nine's one where you can play an infinite number of players if you have enough copies. I don't know how cheap number nine is, but I know I played a three box game at a board game night where the entire store played the same game at once. And you basically played it like Mingo, right? Someone called out seven and everyone put their sevens out. That'd be a good one for, for a big group if you had it. There you go. Uh, we've got not yet played in the chat room saying Super Mega Lucky Box is great for the advanced bingo crowd. Oh, there you go. I, again, I've heard good things about that one. Uh, Red Meeple Ryan called out Zularetto. Um, that is a good one. I, we uh, One of the first hobby board games I taught Sean was Zularetto. We brought it up to his house. It was it was still new hotness at the time. <laughs> and we played around as Zularetto. Nice, simple. That's a good one. You can get the kids involved. It, it, you're sorting animals, right? You're drafting and sorting animals by type. And then there's the neat mechanic where if you get a male and a female, you get a bonus animal. Simple to learn. Just don't bother teaching people the scoring. Just to kind of give them an idea what they're going for and work out the score at the end on your own. I was tempted at one point to start suggesting some sports games. But at the same time, there's so many sports on TVs. It's going to be hard to compete with that sort of thing. And a lot of them yeah. have that little heavier weight or at least entry point of knowledge that's required. Even if you understand baseball perfectly, Playing the baseball board game is going to take a little bit of extra of ramp up and stuff. So unless you've got some sort of, you know, dexterity based uh, football game or something that you can play, uh, some of those sport games may not be the best, despite the holidays being quite a sporting type of time often. Yeah, again, your dexterity games are probably your, your go to's here, right? You can still buy the old electric football, the mm -hmm. vibrating table that still yep. exists. Um, like the company that made them back then still makes them now. I can't remember the name of the company off the top of my head. Some of the, um, the tabletop curling type games yeah, and things uh, like the that. Tabletop curling. Um, uh, what's it called? The, the one that originated in Ontario hexagonal board played it at origins. Yes. Um, uh, <laughs> Crokinole. Wow. Yes. Crokinole. Crokinole. Wow. Sorry. Crokinole is a great one. Yep. You, you set up the table, you play, you play, you know, uh, a, a two player, four player game and then switch up who's playing. Crokinole is a great one, actually. I, that, that, you, do that, need the, you do need a good flat table for that one. So, yeah, that's true. You, you need your folding table in the backs. Um, Twilight Imperium during the holidays. We did. <laughs> we used to do a, a, a Twilight Imperium night this time of year because people tended to be off work and have time off. So we would 
do a, a big Twilight Imperium and order pizza thing. That was third edition, though. I didn't actually pick up fifth. Uh, what else do we have? Do we have much else on here? No. Oh, yeah, lights uh, and yeah, point salary is really a great one, though. I definitely recommend, yep. like, if you're going to throw something into your pockets for uh for for a, a holiday with family point salad is just fantastic it's so easy to pick mm. up like there's no you don't even need rules for that game oh yeah almost not a uh, blood on the clock tower is a a recommendation from eggman based on werewolf because it's one of those the players still play until the end um even has one more vote after you're dead you still get a vote um there's lots of others there's all the one night werewolf there's there's enough variants now that make it so for one there's no player in elimination two there's no um moderator required uh just as usual that those aren't games we're generally huge fans of so and i think actually for sale uh mentioned in the chat room is yep. a great suggestion especially yep. if you've got people who are eager to play monopoly but you all know it's a bad idea <laughs> get something like for yep. sale out there where you get a bit of that, uh, you know, that real estate trading going on, but you don't have table flipping moments and you don't have fights yes. over, uh, you know, free parking and, and all the all the things that come with uh, as baggage along with Monopoly. Hey, if you're going to play Monopoly, at least sit down and agree on your host rules before you start. <laughs> Actually, yes. that goes for any of these games. Whenever you're getting together with family. Uh, if you're going to play play Uno, make sure, you know, which rules are you using. Can you play a plus four, draw four on top of a draw four or not? Um, if you're playing Monopoly, are you putting the money on free parking? Like, like talk about all that before you start. Yeah, That's important. Even with worse, Catan. Nothing worse than, than, than fighting with the family over holidays over something as silly as a board game. Yes. Yes. Catan's another one. A lot of people have host rules for Catan. And most don't make the game worse. And most of the people I know that hate Catan hate it because they were playing with people who change the rules in some way and thinking they're making it better. Well, uh, be so fair, Project L is Tetris based. I now remember it. There is a Tetris game. Drop It would be a great one because mm -hmm. you can do teams. We've done teams in Drop It. I played Drop It with eight players before and it worked. Yep. Um, we should call it No Thanks. I'm, I'm kind of surprised we didn't think of it. No, what it is, I don't own No Thanks. Mm. Despite the number of times I recommend people buy that game and the number of times I played it at events, it's never been my copy. <laughs> no Thanks is another good, big group one. Nice, simple to teach. Do you want the card or not? Put a token on or keep it. Add them up. Lonely, the lowest card in a straight counts. Yeah, not yet played mentioning roll and rights. Yeah, again, you know, especially yeah. if you've got that single input, multiple output type game where only one person is just rolling the dice every time. You don't have to pass dice around. Everyone mm -hmm. just kind of does their own thing based on whatever the dice say. That's a that's a great way to to yeah. make things easy. Like all you have to do is here, take this card and do something based on these numbers or, or whatever. Um, that's and then a great the, way to get people involved. And there's really simple ones too, like, like quicks. Right. Like you don't have to grab Thrones of Valeria, uh, <laughs> Dice Kingdoms of Valeria may not be the best one to hand out to your family when they have to decide, well, which way do I go on this path and where do I spend this? No, stick to the simpler ones in general. Yeah. Unless unless you have a family that's like super into games or like, oh, we love dice games. We love Yahtzee. We love zombie dice. Show us something more. Then maybe you bring it out again. This is all going to be very tailored to whoever you're playing with. Absolutely. No, thanks. Play seven. So I actually thought it was more. I think I played more. I don't think there's. Again, like, I, I don't know what the actual player limit is on the Great Dumb Moody. <laughs> I, we just, everyone's hands are smaller if you play with more people and players get eliminated a little quicker, but it still works. All right. Thank you very much, Lobby, for those additional suggestions. Um, I, I greatly appreciate uh, everyone who showed up tonight. We've had a very busy chat room, which is awesome. A nice uh, way to close out the year for us. Um, so again, we're going to be back once more, but by the time that episode goes live, it'll be 2024. Wow. So thank you all for joining us for that chat. Please stick around, though. We're going to refill our coffees, then we get a review, and then I've got quite a bit to talk about in the Bellhops tabletop. Uh, you'll get to learn lots about the 12 games, uh, Bah Humbug and the 12 Games of Christmas. <laughs>